All right, so today we're going to be continuing on with our discussion of chemistry. And today we're going to be looking a little bit more specifically at biochemistry, as it says at the top here, where chemistry and biology meet head on. So when you really take the word biochemistry and break it down, it's basically saying the chemistry of living things. And obviously this can be quite important to us because we are living things. So when we look at what's going on in the body or in any particular organism, it's all the different reactions that are taking place. So those chemical reactions that take place in the organism. It's what we refer to as its metabolism. So we're going to see really when we talk about biochemistry, we're talking about these organic molecules. So molecules that are mainly lots of carbons and hydrogens and usually larger than the non-organic ones, which generally don't have, tend to have a lot of carbon or hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Those are the ones that are usually mostly found in organic molecules. And when we look at the different types of organic molecules we're really going to talk about and focus on in living things, these are really going to be what we refer to as the macromolecules that make up pretty much the cells. So the main macromolecules of cells, there's really four different types. You're going to have those carbon, and a lot of these you actually will find on your cereal box. So these, the first three, if you look or know what you're looking for, you can find something that is going to refer to these first three. So first one is carbohydrates or carbs. A lot of times if you look on a cereal box, it's going to be your sugars. Uh, lipids, also known as fats. Protein, it's generally on the cereal box, it's protein. One thing you're not going to see on the cereal box is the nucleic acid, which is the fourth macromolecule. And again, obviously, because we are made up of these things, it's not surprising that these are also things that we have to take in in our diet to make sure we have all the nutrients we need. Not surprising we have to eat a lot of the same things we're made up of. And a few important things to remember as we go through these different uh, macromolecules is, and these are going to be things that I would focus on and definitely would be something that myself or some other instructor might ask you on a test, and that is going to be, what is the basic subunit? So what's the basic subunit of a carbohydrate, lipid, protein, or a nucleic acid? Then after that, what are the main function of this particular macromolecule? So what is the main function of carbohydrates or proteins, for example? And then finally, what are some common examples that you would find in the body or in nature of these different macromolecules? And again, this is going to help you to remember what makes these different macromolecules unique by remembering some of these main examples. So what we're going to start with is our first one is going to be a carbohydrate. And the picture you have on the right here is an example of a carbohydrate. So how do we identify a carbohydrate? So how do you know it's a carb? Well, the biggest thing here is if you look at the pretty much the molecular formula of this, your carbon to hydrogen to oxygen ratio is always going to be a 1 to 2 to 1. So for example, I think the one over on the right here is actually glucose. It would be C6H12O6. So that 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen. Every carbohydrate is going to have this same ratio. And Usually because there's so much oxygen here, these are what we would call polar molecules. So when you put them into solution, they dissolve really easily in water. Because of that, it's easy for enzymes to get at them, and it's also more often than not easy for enzymes to break these down. And there's usually a lot of energy in these because it is a high energy bond of those carbon to hydrogen bonds. A lot of times we refer to these as single or simple sugar is what we call a monosaccharide. And what are the main functions of carbohydrates? Big thing here is going to be the short-term energy storage. So it gives a lot of time short-term energy or media energy. So things like glucose, you can break it down really quickly to release energy. There's also some examples of some structural carbohydrates as well. Not so much in humans, but you would see like the exoskeleton in a bug is a actual carbohydrate, that chitin exoskeleton. Or in plants, cellulose is actually a polysaccharide, so a chain of sugars. So monosaccharides, those are going to be your simple sugars, things like glucose, fructose. You can get some of the more still pretty simple sugars, but they're disaccharides and also two sugars hooked together. So what most of us refer to as sugar is actually sucrose, which is a disaccharide. That's your table sugar. Or lactose, which is milk sugar. 
And finally, you get to some of these polysaccharides, so starches, so you need things like potatoes, a heavy kind of starch there. That is a polysaccharide, a bunch of these glucoses, let's say, hooked together. Glycogen is our form of kind of animal starch. It's how we store large amounts of carbs in our body. And cellulose, like I was referring to in plants, is another example of a more complex sugar, complex carbohydrate. And again, things that we'll eat that are going to be high in carbohydrates or at least contain them. Breads and cereals, definitely high amounts of those in there. Also a lot of uh, carbs in certain fruits, especially if they're really sweet fruits. Pasta, again, because they're made up of uh, flour. And then again, certain vegetables can be quite high in carbohydrates as well. And how easy are these to store? It really depends on how soluble they are. Generally, the smaller the carbohydrate, the more storable it is, and generally polarity as well. So when it's more polar, it's a lot of times easier to dissolve and you can get it into solution a little bit easier and therefore it's easier to store. And one of the ways we store these is as glycogen. So in the body, this is going to be your main way to kind of store up some sugar outside of fats. So if you eat a lot of monosaccharides or kind of some of those highly processed complex carbs like breads, your body is going to take this in and break it down really quickly and your sugar is going to increase. Uh, if you eat more complex carbs, a lot of times it takes a little bit longer to break that down before they can get absorbed in there. But again, anytime you get excess carbs, what your body's going to try to do is tuck it away as glycogen and fill up those glycogen stores, which it can tap when there's a need. So myself, I like to run marathons and it's one of the big things that you're trying to conserve as you train, as you learn to Get, you train to get your body to be much more efficient at managing these glycogen stores and not tapping into them too quickly and using them up. If you've filled up your glycogen stores beyond that, you're going to start taking these sugars then and converting them into fats for more of a long-term storage. And that'll be the next one we'll look at, which is lipids. So lipids, you can see here a couple different types here. It's showing you a triglyceride and a... Uh, on the left is your triglyceride, on the right is your cholesterol molecule, which is actually the basis for a lot of your steroid hormones. So the structure of these things, lots of carbons and hydrogens. You can see you get these really long chains of carbons and hydrogens. There is some oxygen, but usually not much in terms of oxygens in these things. So most fats are quite nonpolar, meaning they really don't like water. So the monomers are these fatty acids, those little chains, and again, because there's so little oxygen and these are nonpolar, I always use the example, if, if you think about like a Italian dressing, for instance, you, if you look at the bottle, you're going to see that bottle, let's say this is the bottle, and you get that little separation where here's the fat, the, excuse me, the water and the other vinegar and things like that, and then the fat sits on top, and what do you have to do? You have to shake it up in order to uh, get it to all go in solution, and what happens if you let it sit? It'll separate back out. So that's what we mean by not dissolvable in water. Because of this, your body's dealing with lipids is usually a little bit more difficult, so digesting them, breaking them down is more difficult because it's always harder to get enzymes to them to break them down. And when you get into the digestive system, you'll talk about how the body actually works around that. Main functions here, again, long-term energy storage, so excess calories, you're gonna a lot of times tuck these away into fat, Another thing, at least with the steroid hormones, it is a signaling molecule, so it can send signals from one cell to another, like with testosterone or estrogen, for instance. We do use this to insulate, and if you don't think we insulate that much, think about, uh, let's say, like a whale or something else like that with their two-foot thick, two thick walls of blubber. It's a way to insulate, keep the body warm in the interior. It also does serve as a shock absorber. And again, protection, so certain things in there like waxes on fruits and things like that also are lipids that help protect the body or earwax, for example, in us. So certain fat, uh, certain examples of this, generally your fat, so saturated and unsaturated fats. And if you're really knowing, wanting to know the difference, if you look down at the bottom here, you're going to see how it has those three little tails on those triglycerides. If there's no double bonds in those tails, they look like the one there that says beef fat. It has three straight tails on it. They can pack in really close together. That's a saturated fat. So something like butter, a saturated fat, it is solid at room temperature. If I was to show you olive oil at room temperature, what do you see? It's a liquid, right? And the reason for that is its tails have double bonds, like the one that says linseed oil over there. 
has these double bonds and that will kink the tail. Because of this, they stay liquid at much cooler temps. If you were to put, let's say, your olive oil in the freezer, it would actually become a solid much more like butter. So cholesterol is another one there, your different steroid hormones, and then again, phospholipids, which we will get into a lot more when we talk about uh, the cell and cell structure. Those are what actually make up the cell wall. Excuse me, not the cell wall, the cell membrane. I apologize there. The next one here, and probably the most diverse of all your macromolecules, is going to be your proteins. So the main thing on these ones, they, again, similar elements in there, so carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, but the one thing that makes these different is, different is there's a nitrogen in the backbone. So that amino acid structure on the right, which is the basic subunit of proteins, you can see it has a carbon-carbon-nitrogen backbone. And that R group just refers to, there's 20 different amino acids. That R group is different in each one of these. And you get these things together, they can fold into different shapes depending on what we're talking about. So there is certain ones that are more rope-like in their structure and we also, so these are, would be a lot of times we refer to them as fibrous proteins. So things like collagen, which I'll show you an example in a little bit. You also have different globular proteins. These are the ones that are going to fold up into a particular shape and could be like uh, an enzyme or a receptor. Antibodies, things along those lines are a lot of times going to be these globular proteins. And just to remind you, the basic subunit is an amino acid. So Collagen, you can see on the left here, it does actually look a lot like, uh, it looks like a braided twine and or braided rope. And just like braided rope, rope is really strong at being pulled on from the ends like this, but if you pull on in the middle, it's not real strong. Collagen's kind of the same way, it's but it's the main component of our tendons and ligaments. You pull on those in one particular direction, they're really strong. Where you can see a globular protein like myoglobin or hemoglobin, it has a particular shape, a lot of times these are going to end up being enzymes with a particular active site. And again, this is another thing we'll get into in a later show here, talking about enzymes. But these globular proteins have a particular shape and it allows them to have a particular function. Again, big surprise, structure and function. So you can see the hemoglobin up on the top left there. You can see actin, more of a fibrous protein. You can see how it's a twisted or braided type of looking thing again there. And our last macromolecule that we're going to hit on here is the nucleic acid. This is the one that's not on a cereal box. The basic subunit of a nucleic acid is going to be what we refer to as a nucleotide. And it is actually a molecule that has three parts to it. It has a phosphate molecule, a nitrogenous base, and then a sugar that is holding that all together. So depending on what we're talking about here, there's a few main types. So I'd say the two main types of nucleic acid that we're going to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, at least a little bit more in EMP, is going to be DNA, so deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA, ribonucleic acid. We'll also talk about the energy molecule, which is a basically like an RNA nucleotide, but it has three phosphates. That's ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. It's going to be the main form of cellular energy that's going to get moved around, so it's kind of the energy currency of the cell. So this kind of shows you the basic nucleotide structure. You can see you have that phosphate group. If we're looking on the upper left here, you have the phosphate group attached to the five carbon sugar and a nitrogenous base. Depending on if we're talking about DNA or RNA, the sugar is a little bit different. So you can see there's the loss of an oxygen and deoxyribose, that sugar. And if you look at the bottom of those different pyrimidines and purines, those are going to be your different nitrogenous bases. So that nitrogen-containing base, it, those are going to be different depending on what's going on here. And we'll get into this a lot more as we talk about DNA metabolism. So DNA is the, uh, the information storage of our cells. You can see it's actually a double helix. So you can see these two chains over on the left there wrapping around together, hooked together by what we, if you recall, our hydrogen bonds. And then you have that phosphate sugar backbone. So a lot of times I think about like a twisted ladder. The nitrogenous bases make up the rungs and that sugar or phosphate make up the sides of the ladder. And again, DNA will be the main one we'll talk about on a lot of this. Its main thing here is it pretty much has all the information for those cells to function. Codes for proteins, codes for its own regulation of making those proteins, and it's able to copy itself so when cells divide, each cell has a new set of instructions. And again, we'll go into the nucleic acids a lot more when we get into that stuff in later shows here. So I hope you enjoyed this one, and we'll see you next time.